feel a little low. Right you actually where you kind of want it right now. I would, okay. I'd, I'd hold this. These Air Force pilots are refueling their C-17 Globemaster III at 26,000 feet in the air. That's good. Back, back. Now be patient. Just see what it gets you. It does. Really good. The pilots rendezvous with a KC-10 refueler jet that pumps gas down through a controlled boom at 1,100 gallons per minute. Contact, boom and pump. Five seven contact. Nice job, Drew. Way to flex with it. Yeah. Break away, break away, break away. It's one of three missions we saw while embedded with a crew training to fly the C-17. At 174 feet long and 55 feet tall, the C-17 has a maximum payload of around 170,000 pounds and can land on runways shorter than 3,500 feet, with just three crew members manning the aircraft. We can do everything from supporting contingencies, so the war downrange. We can uh, support COVID missions has been a big thing recently. We can also do humanitarian missions, so helping uh, evac sick patients, wounded uh, soldiers. Due to its high payload capacity, C-17s were used in August 2021 to evacuate people from Afghanistan, with one plane carrying 823 passengers. The basic crew of a C-17, uh, there's three of us. There's a pilot, a co-pilot, and one loadmaster. So my role here as a C-17 loadmaster is to load these aircraft, whether it be helicopters, tanks, Humvees, ambulatory patients. Ultimately, our mission is to support someone else. The average salary of a C-17 pilot stationed at Travis Air Force Base is around $117,000. And the typical tour is about three years. Training happens here at Travis Air Force Base in Fairfield, California, one hour northeast of San Francisco. And before pilots complete missions in the sky, they practice the complicated maneuvers in a state-of-the-art simulator. It's pretty realistic. Uh, we use it to practice emergencies that you can't practice in the jet or you wouldn't want to practice in the jet, uh, whether that's multiple engine losses or really poor weather conditions. Fire number two, engine. Confirm number two. Number two. Students train for emergencies like enemy threats and hydraulic failures. But the first scenario is a simulated engine fire. Could you please uh, scan the number two engine for us? Uh, we're showing engine fire indications. And then uh, I've got the radios, you've got the checklist. Roger. A lot of crew coordination happens at that time, so that's a good safe space uh, for young co-pilots to first get the feel for what the stick and power inputs feel like before you go do it in the jet. Emergency engine shutdown checklist is completed. 221, left. After practicing in the simulator, the crew meets in the briefing room to plan a live training mission. Uh, so training flight tomorrow, showtime is a little non-standard. We're going to do 6.30 local showtime at base ops. Pilots and crew spend hours the day before a mission discussing the route, the objectives, and backup plans if anything goes wrong. So if we're in a failure to disconnect position, the main thing is just maintain a good stable platform, keep doing what you're doing if you're pilot flying. The crew finalized their plans and were dismissed to prepare for the flight. Precisely at 1000, the crew boarded the plane and ran through their final checklists. The first exercise of the training mission refueling in midair. So air refueling is basically thinking about a gas station in the sky. Uh, the whole concept there is we have two aircraft meeting at the same point in space. So it can be um, potentially sensitive cargo you're carrying and you don't want to stop. Um, or perhaps they're just not a good place to land or maybe you don't have the time to land. Do a little low. Right actually there, where you kind of want it right now. I would, okay. I'd, I'd hold this. So we'll be about a thousand feet below the other aircraft and then eventually closing that altitude gap to where their boom, uh, that's the long pole that sticks out of the aircraft to actually pass the gas from their aircraft to ours, we end up making contact with their boom. I think we got big throttle inputs yeah. in, the, in the backing up. So you just have to, now you're going to have to work a little harder to kind of find the null again. Good. good. Back, back. Now be patient. Just see what it gives you. It does. A good saying is, uh, you know, aim small, miss small. When we're air refueling, we're focusing on very small details and trying to see 
like small movements because small movements that close can make a big impact. Refueling happens while pilots maneuver the C-17 at 300 miles per hour, nearly 30,000 feet in the sky. Contact, the winter phone. Five seven, contact. Yep, yep. For me, I was thinking about improving uh, my power movements. So my, uh, my stick movements, so my right hand, I was sitting in the right seat, were pretty solid, but like my, my throttle movements could have been a lot better. So it's something that I can work on in the future. Break away, break away, break away. I don't see break, very nice. Nice job, dude. Phase two of the mission involves low-level flying. So low-level flying during the day, we can go as low as 300 feet above the ground, which is pretty low for a large aircraft. Um, and the intent there is to stay below the radar picture of a potential adversary. So when you're lower, there's a few tactical benefits that we have that help us get to a not-so-great spot in a safer manner. All right, you want to fly a little bit, dude? Let's center on. That's because we need to fly what speed, right? We need to fly to 90. Out there flying it, we're... we're uh, watching our altitudes and making sure that we're clearing any obstacles or anything like that. We also had another pilot in the back uh, looking at the map and the chart, calling out different towers on each side of the route and uh, helping us avoid them and clear them that way. Pretty sweet view, huh? Oh, yeah. The C-17 headed north towards Moses Lake, Washington to practice landing in an assault zone. So an assault zone is a short runway, typically they're about 3,500 feet, and then it has a marked zone that's 500 feet uh, long, and our goal is to put our aircraft in the 500 foot box, and then use max effort to stop on the remaining uh, runway. Crews have to master landing on a traditional airstrip as well as temporary runways. So the tactical part of the C-17 is it goes to fields that uh, maybe have shorter runways or dirt runways, and oftentimes those are in combat locations or austere fields. Pull back up on the stick and put a little bit of power in. 500 feet in front of the zone. Not sure. And full stop, everybody. Minimum. 300 feet in front of the zone with a correction. Not sure. 50 feet. The final mission, a combat offload back at the Travis Air Force Base. Basically what we'll be doing is simulating a, an expedited offload. Typically if we're in a um, situation in which we don't have the equipment to do a download, if we have to get in and out really quick, maybe a hostile location. Once we release the lock, we'll say brakes released as well to the pilots, and then they will hit the throttles, release the brakes, and the pallet will go out of the aft into the aircraft. We'll call load clear, close up, and then we'll get out of here. Overall, it was a great sortie for everyone. It was very busy and very long, so it's always tough to go fly for six hours and constantly be engaged. But I think everyone performed really well. I think uh, a lot of people relate cargo jets to oh, like an airliner, but what we do I think is very different. Specifically, we go anywhere and everywhere in the world. Sometimes that means you have lots of information on that airfield, sometimes it means you have none. And so like I said, you have to be a problem solver and really think on your toes. So it's really rewarding when you go pick up um, you know, 150 guys who have been deployed for six months and you get to bring them home to their families.